Welcome to All the F Words, a podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we'll focus on a theme starting with the letter F. Things like firearms, fantasy, and fundamentalism. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives and look to the experts for insights and ideas. Today, we're going to talk about feminine hygiene, as in period management and its related products, a subject that for some reason makes an awful lot of people very squeamish. Hmm, I wonder what that reason could be. I'm thinking sexism. Ding, ding, ding. You are correct, madam. As if it weren't bad enough that as a society, we treat a perfectly natural process, which a large percentage of the population experiences monthly as gross. Now there's a massive tampon shortage, which is creating a world of problems for a lot of people. So have you heard about this tampon shortage? I, you know, I have to admit I haven't. Tampon is um, a concept from an earlier life. I don't think about tampons much and somehow this has completely bypassed me. It's been very, very hard to find them. Um, I, I could not only could I not find my usual brand in stores or online. Um, I had to buy um, a different absorbency than I normally do. Um, So my period is supposed to start in a few days. We'll we'll see how that goes. Um, But yeah, it's truly, it's, um, I mean, it's much like the formula shortage in, in that people literally across all demographics are having a hard time finding what they need. So I'm assuming this has something to do with the supply chain issues that have happened post pandemic. And yet I'm also guessing that is not the entire story. And dare I say that if this were something that men used each month, we wouldn't be looking at a shortage. Yeah. I I feel like we're repeating ourselves from our formula (laughs) episode. I know. And uh, I mean, yes, and our fetus episode, it's like a kind of a thing right now, a bit of a theme, things that um, uh, cis men don't have to worry about that the rest of us often confront. So uh, what's behind the tampon shortage are a few things, supply chain issues that have been plaguing a lot of products. Um, also the rising price of raw materials. And then there's the recent lockdown in China on production and general staffing issues that have been going on um, in connection to inflation and a variety of other COVID related issues. Um, even before the um, shortage, the the price of tampons has surged nearly 10% over the past year. So it's it's been a significant problem. Um, but before we actually get into the um, sh- the tampon shortage, what you can do if anything, and um, you know what I've learned about it, I want to actually go back in time a little bit and talk about um, the history of feminine hygiene. Oh, I like this pretty- idea. It's super interesting, and I'm also well. We'll we'll get we'll get to the part that I'm hoping that you can uh, share about. But so, I'm going to give you. It's a little. It's it's more complex as with so much stuff that we talk about on all the F words. It is a bit more complex than I thought it was going to be. So, uh, let's start. We'll go back to 3000 BC, the fifth century. I am um, fastening my seatbelt. So- <laughs> fasten your seatbelt, fasten your sanitary <laughs> napkin belt, make sure all your belts are fastened. And if you don't know what a sanitary napkin belt is, we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Oh, so, I can tell you um, stories. I am very excited. I've been really hoping that you will tell me about those. Um, <laughs> so in the fifth century, historians believe ancient Egyptians made tampons out of softened papyrus. And um, Hippocrates who is considered to be kind of the father of medicine. He wrote that ancient Greek women used to make tampons by wrapping, brace yourself, bits of wood and lint. And some women 
used sea sponges at the time. And that is actually a practice that's still in use today. And it's thought to be where the sponge, the, um, the uh, birth control method, the sponge as in sponge worthy on Seinfeld. You know what I'm talking about? The sponge? No, the but I do, I do know about what sponges are. And I'm imagining, first of all, wait, I just have to ask you, a sponge is a living thing. Did they kill the sponge before they put it in there? You know, I think killing a sponge is um, a fair, it's like, I, oh, yes, I'm pretty sure they were not putting live sponges. Um, Li- in, live sea creatures. Their, live sea creatures. You know, I have, you've heard of that manic or that pedicure where you put your feet in. Oh, your face is telling me you've never heard of this. Okay. No, I have. And there's uh, little fish we, floating around. Yeah. There's little fish, fish swimming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Actually, so I'm not, that apparently. I'm hoping to have a pedicure like that in Japan when I go in September. Oh. I would love to have a little fish swimming between my toes. We will have to live stream that because I am super fascinated, a little freaked out by the idea, but I'd love to love to hear how it would go. Knowing you, you will probably make friends with the fish. You would leave and like take them to lunch. So that would be my Um, So back to the sponges. I believe my guess <laughs> back back to the vagina sponges. So uh, it doesn't specify, but I would guess that just as you would if you were going to use a natural sea sponge as a bath sponge or a dish sponge, you would let it dry, which I think kills it. I think it's a pretty non-traumatic way um, to as as far as animal murder goes. I think letting a sponge a sea sponge dry is probably not as upsetting as say like killing a lobster. So um in a in a so vat of hot that water, was... horrible idea. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, <clears throat> the few times I have cooked lobster, I have actually read that the most humane way to do it is to s- smack them in the middle of their eyes with like the blade of a chef's knife so that it kills them right away. And um, when I have done that, I have been sprayed with lobster goo and it has been a whole thing, but it was a lot less upsetting than putting them live into the pot. So word to the wise. This conversation is enough to make me vegan. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We have covered a lot of um, aquatic life considering this is an episode about feminine hygiene. So I'm going to bring us back to the 5th through the 15th century women used rags as makeshift pads, which is what led to the term on the rag. I'm actually surprised to learn that that is such an old phrase, but there you are. In the medieval period, there's a lot of religious shame surrounding menstruation. Um, So that is, you know, there's, there's stuff in, in lots of religious texts about menstruation being unclean, impure, etc. So that's kind of the basis of where a lot of that comes from. So then in in 1822, um, oh, oh, I have to tell you one more thing about uh, medieval periods. So another common belief was that burning a toad and wearing its ashes around your neck was a good way to ease cramps. So did you try it? Have you tried is- that? <laughs> as soon as I run out of my doll, I will. Because um, also, okay, I want to say, eight, ca- I want to say, cannabis also a very good way to relieve menstrual cramps. But I digress. Yes, yes, yes. I can confirm that that is true. That is true. the The combination of of uh, cannabis and a little ibuprofen and a, maybe a heating pad works. It's a hell like of a, a cocktail. A hell of a cocktail, yeah. Gabby. <laughs> Wait, can I just throw in, because this is such a rich topic. Can I just throw in a little craziness right here for just, I'll do it in less than a minute. It's the 1970s, like around 1976. And I'm living in this house in Berkeley up in the hills. And one of my roommates' name is Connie Eastman. And she changes her name to Connie Eastperson. And she, and I cannot make this up, was getting her master's in menstrual folklore. Okay, go on. Wow. So she probably knew all about the I'm toad. guessing. I'm guessing. Oh, wow. Well, if you're listening, Connie, you're doing the Lord's work. So moving on, 
In the 1850s, women pin cotton and flannel to their bloomers when it's their time of the month. And that is around the time when menstrual belts, which are cloths um, that belt uh, with with belts on cloth belts that kind of have this absorbent fabric and they are pinned like a pad. It's almost like um, old fashioned pantyhose, but for when you're on your period. And so following that, the in 1896, the first commercially available pad hits the market. It's called Lister's Towels. Um, but menstruation at the time is still a really big taboo. So women don't want to be seen purchasing Lister's Towels and it ends up a failure. So in 1920, French World War I nurses invent the modern pad. They use extracellulose, a blend of acrylic cotton used for bandages, um, and combine them to, to soak up menstrual blood. And that's when Kotex um, gets wind of the idea and they develop a cellulose pad for commercial sales. And this leads to a lot of different similar products. In the 1920s, tampons come onto the market as a lot earlier than I thought. Um, pads are, are overtaking tampon cells or sales um, so as like a leak-free solution because both uh, products still hadn't really perfected anything yet, but tampons uh, leaking at the time was a problem. Okay, so in 1922, the menstrual belt is finally patented. And that is where we get into, uh, there's a lot of other tampon business stuff that happens over this timeline I have in front of me that I'm not going to share. But I remember in health class, in sixth grade, watching a very old video. Um, the boys went in one classroom, the girls went in another classroom, and we watched these videos, and they were from the 60s or something. And, you know, this is like the mid 90s. And our teacher said, okay, this next part you can ignore because we don't have these anymore, and but we're still going to watch it. And I then watched this lady explain how to use. Um, what I believe is called a, san a menstrual belt or a sanitary napkin belt. And I'm curious, did you have something like that? Of course. You did? Of you course did. I okay. did. So let, me, so let me just jump in and say, sixth grade, apparently that's the time that you do this. That we, would have, we had a mother-daughter tea. And it was so exciting because this meant you were going to be a woman. And it was like, outside of regular school hours and you got to go with your mother and wear a little dress. And the whole thing was sponsored by Kotex. And oh wow. Like that's, you know, this is one of those things where they had cornered the market. So we're, we're talking now in the early 60s. And um they had a, a, a packet called Very Personally Yours. I remember it so well because it made such an impression on me. And it came with, you got, they gave it to you because the idea was they were getting you as a customer for life. So they might as well invest some money and give you like a starter pack with your own little pad in a little tiny box, one or maybe three, I don't know, to get you started and your own belt. And they gave us instructions about how to attach the front and the back of the pad to this little belt. Now the original ones actually had metal and it was cold. It was like up against your skin, but then they improved them and they made them plastic. Okay. So, so that, can you, for those people who've never heard of <laughs> such a thing, can you just walk us through what is a menstrual belt or sanitary napkin belt and how, how'd you put it on? Do you, how do you attach a pad? Can you just sort of Walk us through this. Sure. So imagine that it's a piece of elastic that you would just put on over your head and as a as a belt. And then in the front of it and the back of it, there's like a little garter, like attachment thing. So it's like a little thing that attaches that you then, this is going to be very hard to describe. Like you put the the way the pad was constructed is that it was like, imagine a bandage or like a really thick a gauze pad, like on steroids, like a lot of cotton in there, but, and then with some sanitary gauze type fabric over it. 
And then on the front and the back, there's just some very thin gauze that you run it through this little metal or plastic piece. And it's got like a tooth. So you run the fabric through it and then you sort of pull it up so it sticks on the tooth. So it makes the pad not slip off. Does that make any sense? And it you do this in the front and in the back. So the pad is between your legs and it's like, then there's this like bump where the front attaches to that little plastic or metal thing in the front and then one in the back. It's very comfortable. I'm lying. Okay. It wasn't comfortable so, at all. So what does on the go look like? Like you put it on in the morning and then you put extra, just the extra pads in your purse. Oh yeah. You've got, Can I mean, change depending this on when you're out. Oh yeah. You have to. You have to. Every time you go to the bathroom, you change it. And also, depending on how heavy your flow was, sometimes you needed to wear two. Oh, my gosh. Because at the so beginning, they really didn't must have, have like, felt like a diaper. Totally. And at the beginning, they didn't have like different degrees of absorbency. That came way later. There was like a pad. That was it. So you had one, two, oh. or, you know, if you had a really heavy flow, you might even wear three. Oh, yeah. You're not just a diaper. It's like you've got this like thing between your legs and you couldn't, you know, we only wore dresses in those days. So you didn't have to worry about this showing through your pants. I know that sounds crazy too, but you weren't like, for instance, I wasn't allowed to wear pants to school. And the other thing was forget about a bathing suit, forget about going swimming. Like when you had your period, you just like, that was it. Right. You're mm. nodding like I can't even imagine. <laughs> oh, and then I mean, here's the other I thing. Can't. Right? And here was the other thing is there was a lot of discussion about when you could start using tampons because at least in my house, my mm. mom thought that could take your virginity. If you put that tampon yes. in there, it could break your hymen and then you wouldn't be a virgin and then God knows what would happen. Yes. Yes. Well, so, um, rely. So there was, there was an issue with, um, well, a few different, a few different issues, but that was a big issue when tampons came onto the market is that people were hesitant to buy them unless they were married because there was this belief that they could, um, that they could, uh, take your virginity, which is just such a, you know, makes me think about our, um, the, the purity culture episode that we did um, first, the first time episode when we talked about virginity, like, like it's so, it's uh, it's so unromantic to imagine that if, if sex, if first time sex for a man is an orgasm and first time sex for a woman is nothing more than the breaking of the hymen. That's just, eh, I mean, in keeping with what we've been talking about a lot on this show, it's pretty depressing. Let's take a break and hear from our sponsor, and, and we'll be right back in a minute. So uh, on the subject of tampons, there's this very, um, there's this, this, there's lots of tampons coming onto the market in the mid, this is like late 60s or um early to mid seventies. And then do you have any recollection of something called rely tampons that came on I the market? I do not. I do not. So in 1975, rely tampons hit the market. They're very absorbent. They're made of polyester and carboxymethyl cellulose, which are um, excellent for uh, absorbing liquid. But unfortunately- I do remember toxic shock syndrome. And I think that's where you're going. Yes. So these materials also breed bacteria much more easily than cotton. And that's when toxic shock awareness hits the mainstream. So they are recalled in 1980. Um, and I remember being terrified when I first started using tampons, gosh, maybe like at the end of high school, I was so afraid of toxic shock syndrome because there was that little, I mean, I think there still is that little pack, uh, like slip in every box of tampons, which, and I think that they probably had to start putting them in around this time because of that. Uh, boy, it's that it surgeon sounded, general probably mandated it or something, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So that mostly gets us uh, up to current day, except for in the 2000s, a product that I have not yet tried, but very well may if this tampon shortage continues, the menstrual cup comes into fashion as an environmentally safe alternative to pads and tampons. I remember the first time I ever saw a menstrual cup at a friend's house. Um, I was visiting a, a friend right after I moved to San Francisco and she had a menstrual cup and I just asked her about it and what it was like. And she said, it's really great. And, you know, and she said this to me with the straightest face as if there, this was the most normal thing ever. She said, um, and, you know, you can use um, the blood it collects to water your plants and they really benefit from the nutrients. And it makes absolute sense. So cool. And I just really had a hard time processing it in the moment. Did she also plant her placenta? Probably, probably. It seems like those sorts of gardening, um, you know, uterus related uh, um, habits might go hand in hand. So a couple things I need to just stop here. One is, is a menstrual cup kind of like a diaphragm, a little piece of plastic that you kind of fold in half and insert and then it captures the the flow? So there... There are, there are two, there's a, there's a a disposable um, and non-disposable kind that's like a flat disc. But then there's also the, I think what the cup generally refers to is it's kind of shaped uh, like an ice cream cone that's, and it's rounded on top. And the cone part is mostly like, it's like a version of a tampon string so that you can pull it out. And the people I know who use menstrual cups say that it's just an absolute game changer, that it's great not having to buy tampons and that it's, you know, cleaner and more reliable. You can have sex with it in. Um, supposedly really great. I haven't um, gotten up the nerve yet to try it, but I'm I'm very curious. Which brings me to this whole notion of squeamish. Now, you say you haven't gotten up the nerve. Is that because you don't want to actually handle your menstrual blood? Because it's going to kind oh. of be there, right? It's going to like spill out and get on your hands. And I don't know. It's it's less about that and more about, I think it's really about, um, you know, do you, do you, did you use tampons at one point? Oh, yeah. At many so points. Do you, do you? <laughs> I mean, the the jump from pads to tampons for me was uh, nerve wracking. Um, and now you think Wait, that why? I had, why? Why? What was nerve wracking? I hadn't. I hadn't. I don't know. I I uh, I, I hadn't really. Not much had been up there, <laughs> and I think you know the. The idea, it's interesting now, now the two babies have been, you know, in and, you know, in and out of my birth. Well, I guess n- they have come out of canal. my birth canal. And so like, canal, canal, <laughs> the canal, right. You know, I, I know, uh, I'm familiar with its depth. Um, I have been having sex for more than 20 years. You know, I've, I've got a little more, um, comfort with everything, uh, everything down there. But I, I think I had, it's like this leftover feeling of putting something into my, it really isn't about blood at all. I'm not um, squeamish about blood, but it's the putting, putting something inside of me and then uh, taking care of it later. It's just, it's just, uh, I, I think it's a mental thing. I think that once, once I, if I get one of these cups, once I start, I think it won't be a big deal at all. But um, and you and you will report back on the show, right? Because everybody's I will, I, dying to know. We will do part two: the Gabby's uh, experience with the uh, menstrual cup special, definitely. Um, so, I mean, that pretty much catches us up. There's one other one other thing in the um, feminine hygiene uh, history that is interesting, and that is that there is a brand of birth control that is a total period stopping birth control. So it's possible to use hormonal birth control to completely stop your period. 
Um, is that safe? Sounds, you know, doctors, doctors say it is, I guess so. I don't know that there's any reason not to. Um, yeah. It seems but, to me yeah. that if our bodies came naturally with a certain process of creating something and then sloughing it off, that seems that it would be optimal to let that happen. But what do yeah. I know? I mean, I, I definitely see, I see that, um, that point and, um, that would probably be my approach as well. I do, I have never really liked hormonal birth control. It always made me feel, um, crazy and bloated, but I do, I do know lots of people who periodically use their birth control. You know, if you don't take the sugar pills, if you just keep on taking the birth control, you can fully skip a period. If, you know, as it, as it serves one, you know, with vacations or special events, that kind of thing. So, you know, maybe, maybe once in a while is, is not so bad. When we describe all this history, we're probably talking about Western civilization. And I had the experience a couple of years ago of being in Uganda and hearing about a particular problem um, which I'm guessing is not unique to Uganda, which is that girls often because of access and also because of poverty don't have the ability to purchase either tampons or pads. And so mm -hmm. they stay home for the week of their period, which is to say that mm -hmm. they miss 25% of schooling. And this was a huge mm. problem. We met with the co-directors of a high school, super interesting because it was a Muslim and a Jew um, who were directing this high school um, in a village outside of Mbale, Uganda. And they said this was one of the biggest problems was not only getting access, and there were a number of NGOs apparently working on this, of getting access to sanitary napkins and uh, tampons for girls, but even more so educating girls as to how natural this mm. process was. This was not something to be ashamed of. They didn't have to sequester themselves inside of their homes during during the week that they menstruated. Um, and it was a real eye opener for us to see that, you know, today in the 21st century where people have cell phones, they, they have cell phones, but they don't have sanitary napkins. Um, and it's really keeping women down. It, well, it is a significant problem in the United States as well. There's something called period poverty, which is the inability to access sufficient quality menstrual products. And even before the recent price increase, many women in the US were affected by period poverty. So um, there was a study conducted in 2021 at the City University of New York School of Public Health that found that the pandemic exacerbated the problem of period poverty significantly with loss of income coming um, as a result of the economic fallout of the pandemic being a strong predictor of menstrual product insecurity. And what that means is similar to what you were describing is that women um, uh, or menstruating people often missed work and would lose out on income because they weren't able to find products uh, to, um, you know, uh, make them feel comfortable being in a public space. And so it's a really significant problem. It's one of the reasons that um, whenever possible, it's a great idea to donate boxes of um, menstrual products to local uh, shelters, uh, different organizations supporting women and menstruating people. So, Good point. Um, so this shortage is a significant issue, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, there is not a lot that can be done, but I would like to talk about some options for people who are facing a lack of of alternatives or, la or lack of, uh, of menstrual products. So the alternatives are, as we were discussing, um, menstrual cups, certainly pads right now are, are, there's not a shortage. And then there's also period underwear. Have you heard of this? I have. You have. 
So I, I also haven't tried this, but I'm, I'm very curious. It makes me think about when I came home from the hospital from after having both my kids, like the whole kit that they sent, sent me home with, with, you know, the mesh underwear and the giant pads. Um, but, uh, but apparently they're a lot more comfortable and you can just wear them normally and they can absorb like one and a half tampons worth of blood. So I don't know. I it guess worth like it a try. Could get, seems like it could get, there's something about after wearing tampons for so long about the blood being external coming, going into the underwear that kind of grosses me out. But you know, what do I know? Um, there, there is not currently a prediction as to when the tampon shortage will end. So uh, it's kind of time to start figuring out what else we're going to do and figure out how to help people who can't afford alternatives to their usual tampons, um, try, try to figure out how to support them and get them products they can use. So, well, it certainly know. sounds like this menstrual cup might be the way to go. Um, it's, mm-hmm. a, I mean, I would say a one-time purchase, but nothing is a one-time purchase these days. Everything has planned obsolescence. I'm sure these do too. But instead of having to constantly buy things, which then, right, go into the landfill, I can only assume it's like diapers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The You know, I I asked a friend about the menstrual cup recently, a different friend from the one who watered her plants with blood. And I asked her about, <laughs> I asked her about how, um, cause so the, the, the way this thing works is, and please, uh, if you're listening and you use a menstrual cup and we we're getting this wrong or you have a perspective, please, please, uh, s- contact us on social media at all the F words pod or all the F words pod at gmail.com because we would love to hear your thoughts about this, but I, I'm trying to envision. So you, let's say you're, in public, you're in a, a stall. Um, you you pull it out. It's t- it needs to be cleaned and then reinserted. So you you walk out to the the sinks, the, the collective sinks, rinse it, and then go back into the bathroom stall and clean it. I don't know. Maybe I would buy two and switch them out. It just I'm having yeah. a hard time with that. But maybe that's because then you're, of this. Then you're carrying it around. What do, you, what do you do? Put it in your purse? Like wrap it up in a hundred pieces of toilet paper and carry it around? I think. I mean, is the problem here? Don't. All right, let's get back to what we sort of first started this episode talking about. Because on one hand, I'm thinking like, ew, gross, so yucky, and everyone's going to be like squicked out. But and then there might be an odor. There might be an odor, but. Is this all just because of because we're just sexist uh, and and everyone's freaked out about women's you know women menstruating and and fluids related to women? No, is you know actually while I'm sort of one to go there, um, if need be, I would say we're just freaked out about bodily fluids in general. I think we're equally mm-hmm. um, flipped out about urine and feces and all of it. So I think. Um, this is just, these are things we'd prefer not to talk about. We just want to take care Uh of them privately and move on. And, um, I don't know what the answer is. There are some stalls that have sinks in them. I would use those. Yeah. Probably (laughs) the best way to go (laughs) for more period advice. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Dear Gabby and Joanne. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to our um, episode. I don't know how to describe this episode. It's a little different than others. Um, Again, we'd love your feedback and we would really appreciate it if you would follow us. Um, All the F-words can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. We are also on social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at All the F-words Pod. And you should email us. We would love to hear from you. Tell us how to use a menstrual cup. Talk to us about what alternative you want to use um, during this shortage. Or let us know if you ever used a sanitary napkin belt and maybe you and Joanne can compare stories. We are all the F words pod at gmail.com. I just want to say menopause is awesome. I can't wait. <laughs>